Imagine yourself as an immigrant child living in a foreign land. You struggle to speak its language. By the time you're six, your father abandons the family. You live in a gang-infested neighborhood where drugs plague the streets. With no formal education or skills, your single mother works three jobs to support the family of your younger sister and you. But she makes just enough money to live in a garage and call the ragged carpet floor a bed. That was my reality. Our family didn't have a lot, but we had enough. My sister and I were quickly exposed to life as our mother knew it. Society labeled us as poor, uneducated, ghetto, Vietnamese immigrants. We were treated as second-class citizens, and all we had were core values to live by. There are three core values that shaped me. Pride, courage, and strength. As I share my story, I'll define these values that allow me to live a life empowered by my will. When I was seven, I had a dream of receiving a golden ticket out of the streets, a full-ride athletic scholarship. And from that point through high school, I trained like a maniac to achieve that dream. And one of the most important lessons my mother taught me growing up is that once you begin something, you finish it. You never stop halfway. So I took that lesson to heart, and I trained at the local park where gangsters tried to recruit me. But I stayed focused on training for basketball by doing sprints, drills, and practicing to be the best I could be. And as I trained, I recalled moments of my mom coming home exhausted from work, and still mustering the energy to make a home-cooked meal for my sister and me. My mom is the epitome of what hard work and sacrifice looks like. So when I trained, I developed the first value of pride and knowing that receiving this golden ticket was much greater than myself. It was for my family. It was to alleviate my mother's worries and be an example for my sister. That pride empowered me to push harder, dig deeper, and go further for when I thought I was tired during my training. But how often do we see people quit when things start to get too hard? Or when they're too tired? Or when it's too early in the morning? See, many people stop halfway and quit because they don't have pride in what they do. They quit because their purpose is only about themselves. And that's selfish because at a certain point in your life, you have to understand that life is not just about you. If every choice and decision that you make is just about you, one day you're going to cross paths with something much tougher than you. It will knock you down and make you quit because you don't have a driving force for your purpose. I believe that when you take pride in a purpose that is greater than yourself, you must honor the sacrifices that others have made for you. Then there's nothing that's too hard. You push through exhaustion. You bounce out of bed before the sun even rises. Adversity becomes nothing. And the moment you understand that life isn't just about you, it's about taking pride in the things that you do as an individual for the people around you so that every day you can look in the mirror and know you gave everything you had to achieve your dream, pride becomes your driving force. When I was 12, the city evicted us from a garage home. And throughout those years, we lived in homes of the same nature. When, when I got to middle school, my sister and I were transferred to a wealthier school district using the address from extended family on our father's side. See, I wasn't performing well academically at this time. So my sister and I were being tutored after school at their house by our uncle. This resulted in us being physically beaten and verbally abused. I was angry, beat down and belittled. More importantly, I was afraid. But I didn't tell my mom because I didn't want her to worry. So I lived in fear and doubt. But when I got to high school, I made the basketball team my freshman year, which was another step closer in my dream becoming a reality. But I was benched most this season. And after that season, the head basketball coach said, Will, you're behind the curb anyway. You need to come back next year. My dream was shattered. I was distraught. And during this time, a campus supervisor, a very large and distinguished man, pulled me aside and he said, Will, you're not a basketball player. You're going to go play football. I was struck with awe and respect because this man saw something in me and he told me what to do. And I want you to understand that football never crossed my mind. So naturally, I was scared to ask my mom. And how I was raised is that many immigrant families don't raise their children to play sports. Those families come to this country to give their children opportunities they never could imagine for themselves. So my mom raised me to focus on my studies, get good grades, and with the idea that Asian boys don't play football. <laughs> so I went home and I asked my mom, Mama, can I please play football next year? And guess what she said? Hell no. <laughs> so I convinced her to join track to throw shot put and discus for the football coach. And after much persistence and nagging, she finally to play football for the upcoming season. And throughout my high school years, I was challenged with negativity from teammates, coaches, and even my family. 
I was always told, Will, you're too small, you're not strong enough, you're not fast enough, you're stupid, you're worthless, you're nothing. So the thing was that I was never enough. One night, my mom told me to quit and stop wasting my time because I wasn't doing the family any favors. But I was empowered by my will to persevere. I cried myself to sleep that night, and I knew that she didn't understand. But she didn't have to, because I did. I persevered with action and used her negativity to fuel my drive. I was empowered by my will to amplify my mind and body beyond its physiological limits, to break a strength record and become one of the strongest athletes in school history. And in that process, I achieved multiple athletic titles in both track and football. Yet, I still haven't received that golden ticket. I was uncertain and afraid of the outcome. And all that fear and doubt that I lived with brought me back into the headspace of that battered 12-year-old boy. At that point, it, questioned, it made me question as to whether I should continue pursuing my dream. At that critical moment, I could have quit. But I knew if I quit, that would have made all those people write about me. I would have lived that regret. But I was determined to prove to myself I was right about myself. That's when I learned the second value of courage, to believe in me, especially when I was challenged by negativity. Because regardless if anyone believes in you or not, you must have the courage to believe in yourself, otherwise it's meaningless. So I ask you, have you ever had that gut-wrenching fear of taking a risk in anything? But you still did it anyway. That's called courage. You can't have courage without fear. And when you have the courage to believe in yourself, to face your fear, that fear no longer controls you. It no longer controls your actions or dictates your decisions. Courage comes from those moments you look fear in his face and you say, try me. Now each of those moments become a reminder as another success of what you have mentally endured and overcome. You will always have fears in this life. So you must have the courage to believe in yourself, to face your fears, so there'll be no room left for doubt. And in the spring of my senior year, halfway through track season, I received a phone call from West Point. The United States Military Academy offered me that golden ticket. On top of that, they said, Will, we want you to come out here to play football and throw in track for us, son. I was so excited. I said, Coach, what I signed, sir? <laughs> and he laughed and he said, Will, you got to come visit the campus first. And fortunately, I was sponsored to fly out to New York with a teammate to visit that campus. That campus was beautifully green, spacious, and the air was crisp with honor and tradition. We toured that magnificent campus and got to the athletic office, sat down. The coach presented me that letter of intent. And as you can imagine, at this moment, I'm physically trembling with excitement. And when I signed that letter, my dream came true. I did it, mama. Now all I needed to do was finish track and be ready after graduation. I finished track with the best shot put throw in my life to receive third place in the state of California. I was invincible and nothing could have stopped me. Three days before high school graduation, I attempted to do a backflip on a trampoline. I landed on the back of my head. My forehead touched my chest. I heard a snap. Immediately, my body seized and slowly sank into the trampoline. I laid there and felt as if all the breath was snatched from my body. The pain felt as if I was being stabbed by millions of needles as a hot frying pan was searing the surface of my skin that radiated from my neck through the tips of my fingers and toes. I realized that I broke my neck. I couldn't wiggle my fingers or my toes. I couldn't lift my arms or my legs. I was completely paralyzed from the neck down. Wide awake and gasping for life, I thought to myself, surely this won't change the course of my life. I will persevere. But little did I know that this would be the most physically and mentally intense journey of my life. I was rushed to the hospital, and what the doctor said is that, here's my C5 vertebra. This rubber band will represent my spinal cord, and beneath that's the C6. I suffered a compression fracture that stretched my spinal cord to its absolute maximum, and it got stuck under the C6. He said if it had moved another quarter inch, I would have snapped my spinal cord and lost my life. And before surgery, I was put into a halo traction device fixed to the side of my head. So we had to drill into the side of my head. With every turn of that drill, I could hear a crunch and feel it carving deeper into my skull. They added 80 pounds of force against my head over the span of eight hours, realigned my spine. That pain was so immense, it would cause me to pass out. And I woke up to relive the pain of my mistake. But what hurt most was looking into to my mom's and sister's eyes to subconsciously tell them that I failed. 
After surgery, the doctor told my family I'd be a quadriplegic for the rest of my life. It was my personal hell. At that moment, the only dialogue in my mind was, no disrespect, doc, but you don't know me. I've been working for my moment since I was seven years old. You didn't come up living in a garage, sleeping on the floor. You were physically beaten and verbally attacked, yet stayed focused and never made an excuse. I was completely paralyzed for nine days, a prisoner of my own body. And in those nine days, I lost 40 pounds like that. I was a skeleton of who I was. I was angry with myself. I felt sorry for myself. I cursed the skies and asked, why me? Until I realized that my tears were going to make me walk again. So I shifted my focus and energy to trying to move. Instead of asking, why me? I said, try me. The next day, I moved my finger and I lifted my arms. Then I was transferred to a rehab center to learn how to move again. Everything that I was prior to this injury was obsolete. Learning how to move eclipsed all the records and titles I held. The only things that remained the same were my name, the support from the people who saw something in me, and being empowered by my will. When I got to the rehab center, I trained for two times a day for four weeks. And here's a video of the process of my recovery. You just all saw that. Will. Our boy is standing. <laughs> yes! They will. Good job. The process was excruciatingly painful and frustrating to relearn basic movements. It felt like the exhaustion of running a marathon just to lift my leg. It felt like being winded from a 100-meter sprint just to curl my arms, and the pain never subsided because my nerves were still haywire. But as I trained, I recalled, as I trained, my pride shifted to honoring the people who saw something in me when I couldn't possibly see it in myself. I reminded myself of the courage I had from withstanding past pain, negativity, and exhaustion, which gave me the courage to believe in myself to move again. My pride and courage gave me the strength to endure and fight this battle to free my body from its own prison. And that's when I discovered the final value of strength. It wasn't because of looking big or being physically stronger, but my strength came from the power of my will. I believe strength can only be developed by having pride and courage. So I want you to think of your mind as a muscle that you want to grow. Your pride is your driving force, your why. Your courage to believe in yourself, to endure the process and persevere. And a muscle can only grow through resistance that causes it to suffer, struggle, and break down before it can come back stronger to withstand future much tougher challenges, the same as your mind. Strength is found through adversity. And if you have pride and courage, you will develop the strength to overcome that adversity. And after 40 days of the most physically, mentally, and psychologically intense training of my life, I learned how to hold a pencil, sit in a chair, to stand and walk again. They call me the walking miracle, and I'm blessed to be here today. The majority of my recovery took another two years of consistent hard work. Now, six years later, I still strive to improve myself every day. There were many things that weren't supposed to happen for me. I wasn't supposed to make it out the ghetto. I made it out and here I am to speak with you. I wasn't supposed to be a football player. I became one of the strongest athletes in my school history. I wasn't supposed to get a scholarship or go to college. I received a full-ride football scholarship to West Point, even though I decided not to go to West Point. Still, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from right here at Cal State Long Beach with a Bachelor of Science degree in Kinesiology for Physical Education. You heard that, right? When I broke my neck, I wasn't supposed to walk again. I battled through. Now I can run. And it revealed my true purpose to educate, inspire, and share my story. So I decided to build a brand for people to represent a symbol that they can be proud of. I was inspired by my core values to use a trident to represent pride, courage, and strength, to live an empowered life, achieve success, and give back to the community. 
not, and that's when Empowered by Will was born. Now I'm partnering with an after-school program to mentor children in underserved communities, and I plan on traveling throughout the country to inspire hope, teach lessons, and build those programs as an inspirational speaker. And I shared my story, not to brag about my accomplishments. The true purpose in sharing my story is to inspire you to have pride in what you do to hold your head high. For you to have the courage to believe in yourself and stand tall. For you to have the strength to overcome your adversity and walk strong. I want you to use my story as an example of how the power of your will can control your reality and change what is supposed to happen. Because the reality is that there will always be struggle and challenges. But instead of being victim to it and using that as an excuse, use that adversity to change your reality. Also, whatever adversity you may face does not mean you're permanently trapped there. It may seem like a reality, but you don't have to let it be your reality. Remember this. If you have pride, courage, and strength, that means you're empowered by will. If you're empowered by will, then you will be unstoppable. <laughs>